If you're a regular listener to the pod, you know that I'm a son of rural Canada, pre-late Saskatchewan, in the rural municipality of Happy Land. Population today, somewhere just north of 150. Mayor, Dara Dukesher. It's my belief that Canada is made stronger by people of our small places, and we'll be spending the next few weeks talking about the importance of connecting rural Canadians on behalf of our presenting sponsor, TELUS. This is a subject that came up just last week in the Liberal government's speech from the throne. Of course, the pandemic has made the role of digital connectivity abundantly clear. And as a matter of public policy, the government has pledged to accelerate their timelines and process to ensure that Canadians, no matter where they live, have access to high-speed internet. On the private side of the equation, TELUS has the best track record of connecting rural Canada to high-speed internet. Since 2013, they've connected 282 rural and remote communities to the TELUS fiber network, with another 50 being connected this year. In remote areas where a fiber build is just impractical or impossible, TELUS has doubled their wireless high-speed LTE coverage, and they've been independently verified as the fastest rural broadband in Canada. There's a lot more to this story, and as I said, we'll be talking more about TELUS's initiatives to connect rural Canadians in the coming weeks. But for now, know why they do it. TELUS believes in bridging digital divides so that all Canadians, regardless of their location and circumstances, are connected to the technology and resources they need. You can learn more about it by going to connectingcanadaforgood.ca. And if you want to learn more about Prelate, it's seven miles east of Leader. Loyal and growing tribe of Hurley Burleyites, it's time for the pod. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll notice that I'm coming to you again from my cottage in a secret location somewhere in Quebec, just north of Ottawa. I was back in Toronto for a couple of weeks there, but it was weird for me. Lots of walking around, wearing a mask, wide swathing around people, watching case numbers rise, and just feeling this vague sense of dread about everything. It's better here up north, I'll have to tell you. It's just my partner Terry and her sister Stephen and her brother Stephen and her sister Karen and our dog Ryder. And the only thing I feel a vague sense of dread about is my 27-year-old septic tank. Maybe you know that feeling. Anyway, it's a hurly-burly two-parter today. First up, we've got Mike Schreiner on the pod. Mike is the leader of the Green Party of Ontario and became the first Green Party MPP in Ontario history, taking the riding of Guelph in 2018. We're going to talk about his own initiatives as leader and the federal prospects for the Green Party provincially and federally. We'll talk about the climate change movement in Canada and Doug Ford's handling of COVID. For part two, we'll bring on Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed, our ever smart, ever strategic, ever sweary political panel. We'll get right down to the fireworks of last night's Trump-Biden debate. After that, it's COVID's second wave. Cases are skyrocketing and what are the implications? Why can't we have government transparency? Where's the data and what the hell is driving decision making? We'll talk a little bit about the elections in BC and Saskatchewan, pick up on our conversation with Mike and take a question from our listener mailbag. Mike Schreiner, I want to welcome you to the Hurley Burley. So great to have you on today. Hey, David, it's a pleasure to be on and I'm a big fan. And can I tell you one Hurley Burley story? So I... I um, I was on some panels during the federal election last year, and Ginny Byrne happened to be in a lot of the green rooms representing the conservatives. I'd be representing the greens. And I finally looked at her one day, and I said, you know what? You have David Hurley to thank for humanizing you for me, because after your Harper and Ford years, I thought you were Darth Vader, but you're actually a really nice person to hang out with. <laughs> You know, the pod has done that for people. It's made people who thought that Jenny was uh, a horrible conservative, you know, (laughs) like her. And it's made people who thought Reed was a ridiculous caricature like him. It has done nothing for me, sadly. My reputation (laughs) remains mired in the same place that it was. Hey, how are you? You know, I'm doing well. I I really consider myself lucky. Uh, Both my wife and I have been able to, you know, obviously hang on to our jobs. And, and, you know, I'm still uh, getting a salary. Uh, But I tell you what, it is tough out there. And I think one of the hardest things about being an elected official right now, and I would say for anybody, city councilor, mayor, MP, MPP, is just really trying to be there for your constituents. Um, I told somebody who um, works in the mental health profession the other day that 
you know what, I think you should provide some training services to elected officials because, you know, we're, we're listening to a lot of people with some very tough stories and challenging situations and just trying to help people navigate through that. It, it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. And, and how do you think wave two is going to go? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't sense any, I don't sense any willingness. Well, not any willingness. That's an overstatement. I don't feel like people are willing to go through what they went through in the spring again. Okay, but yet, I don't. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if people can, especially small businesses. I can tell you, as a longtime small business owner myself, so many small businesses are just barely hanging on, eh? And and another full lockdown would put them out of business. And so it's one of the reasons I'm just frustrated. And I'll have to say, people don't think of me as a guy that gets angry very often, but I'm a bit angry about the way government is, I think, the lack of preparedness for the second wave. I mean, we all knew that when schools reopened in September, there would be huge demand for testing. And the fact that the province wasn't ready for that in terms of having enough testing centers in place, enough lab capacity for a quick turnaround, and really not the, we haven't made the investments in public health for aggressive contact tracing. Um, I'm hoping everyone downloads the app. I mean, that will help, but it's not going to help if hardly anybody has it on their phone. And so we weren't ready there. The fact that the government, the Ford government, was unwilling to make the investments to hire additional staff in schools to lower class sizes to the level that public health officials were saying, you know, 15 max, so we could have physical distancing. And then the final one for me that really breaks my heart, David, is given the tragedy we saw in long-term care in the spring, there were reports over the summer that just said, you know what, we have a staffing shortage, we have to address it. It's likely going to take between 1.6 and $1.8 billion in Ontario to address it. And the Ford government is sitting on $6.7 billion of unallocated COVID funding, like, I don't know why that wasn't used to hire additional staff. So we were ready for the second wave. And it has real economic implications, because if the economy has to shut down, then we're talking about the double whammy of, you know, of the public health crisis that we're facing. But then the economic crisis is only going to worsen. So I think making those investments over the summer to have us prepared for a second wave to put it in business language, would have a high return on investment in avoiding uh, having to lock down the economy again. Sorry, help me with this. Everything you've just said is perfectly logical. And uh, we have been on this show very critical of the lack of preparedness, the seeming lack of groundwork over the last six months while society was locked down to get ready for this second wave. It seems inexplicable. You're on the inside not of the government, but of the legislature. Have you seen anything that explains how this has happened? I mean, how do you go that whole period of time and your only plan for back to school is make sure you have a mask? And testing is a, is a nightmare. I mean, at the very beginning of this, we were talking about testing being the critical, being the critical measure. So what's gone on? Yeah, I find it incredibly frustrating and inexplicable to some expect. I mean, I we had all party briefings over the summer in particular, especially around healthcare. And I kept asking at, at that time, saying, you know, I have constituents calling me saying that the lab turnaround time on their tests were 48, 72 hours. And I kept being told, oh, no, we've got it under control. We've got it under control. You know, that's that's, you know, a rare occasion. Uh, but we, we've seen that, that that's not the case. And so to me, it seems like there's been a huge reluctance, particularly by the Ford government, of just making the financial investments necessary to have us prepared. I mean, we know from the financial accountability officer that 97% of the COVID response in Ontario was from the federal government, only 3% from the Ontario government. And, and I think it's just short-sighted. I mean, I understand, you know, Doug Ford did not get elected to run up big deficits in Ontario. That is not what he campaigned on. So I get that, but we're in a pandemic and getting the public health situation under control is the key to having the economy open and ensuring we're generating jobs, prosperity, taxes to pay for government programs. And so the reluctance to make those kinds of investments, I think is really short-sighted. I mean, I think 
you know, if I can speculate, and I obviously can't speak for government, uh, you know, I mean, maybe they were holding some of that money back in reserve in case they needed it. But the problem is, is it would be far more fiscally prudent to spend the money up front to, per- to contain the virus as much as possible, uh, which then would have had, you know, would have less negative impact on our economy and therefore the province's finances. Yeah, maybe, but I mean, you're being generous. I mean, why would they announce <laughs> yesterday or whenever it was, why would they announce capital improvements in long-term care homes once wave two has started? What were they doing in July? Well, that's what Crazy. I've been asking. <laughs> My first two questions in the fall sitting in the legislature has been around, <laughs> why aren't you hiring more staff in long-term <laughs> care? Like we knew there was a staff shortage. We, we know like we've had, we've had economic reports come out costing what was needed, about $1.6, $1.8 billion. How come you haven't spent the 6.7 to get us ready? And and the minister's response was, oh, well, you know, you can't just hire people overnight. And I was like, that's precisely my point. You should have been hiring it back in this Because <laughs> now, you, now you're going to spend the money. And you're right, you just can't hire them overnight. You should have been hiring them in July. Yeah. So probably they probably you're right. Probably they just don't want to spend the money. But do you not feel the worm turning on this? I mean, as an opposition politician in the spring, it must have been awfully frustrating because all Ford had to do was stand up there and sound avuncular and sound like he was listening to scientists and not Donald Trump. And everybody said, oh, my God, I've completely changed my opinion about Doug Ford. I thought he was a terrible person to be premier, and now I think he's the best person we could possibly have to be premier. Scott Reed was calling him Doug for fuck's sake, and um, so that's where that's where uh, things were in the spring. But I find that there's a lot less patience for this now, and the politics of COVID is getting rougher for incumbents. Oh, it absolutely is, David. And uh, I remember in the spring, and, you know, first of all, you know, Trump set the bar so low in the spring that it was almost like any politician in the world was going to get a, a bump in the polls if they, you know, were mildly competent. And and I will have yeah. to say the premier actually did, a, I, will, I will admit, he did a pretty good job communicating in the spring. He came across as empathetic, folksy, uh, but yet firm about delivering the public health message. Uh, but I think that act is wearing thin right now because I people are starting to say, you know what, empty words, we need action. I think long-term care is a perfect example of that. The testing lineups are an example of that. And, and so, you know, I, I think the premier is very vulnerable right now. The back to school plan, everyone knows was flawed. Long-term care, we're not prepared. We didn't have the testing prepared for a second wave. That's going to have serious uh, economic implications that you know, we wouldn't have been able to completely avoid. I mean, the premier couldn't have, you know, prevented a second wave. We all knew it was coming, but he could have been prepared for a second wave. And so I, you know, reminded my team when uh, some of them were stressing in the spring about, oh my gosh, the premier's numbers are going way up and people like you aren't even on the radar right now because, you know, you can't even get any oxygen right now. I was like, you know what, don't forget uh, Churchill after World War II, you know, man, you would have thought that guy was, would have been a hero that would have been reelected over and over again. And, you know, he was turfed. Uh, because uh, Britain's wanted the country to go in a different direction than he wanted to take it. And and so I think those dynamics will certainly be at play uh, moving forward. So let's just talk about politics for just a sec. Tell me how you got elected. So the Green Party, not a factor in any riding in Ontario except yours. I've been in this situation with Ralph Goodale, the Saskatchewan Liberal Party in the early 80s, Right not mm-hmm. getting our deposit in any riding except his and winning his. So uh, I know how it can happen, but it's pretty rare and pretty interesting. It says a lot about you, if I might say, and probably something about Guelph. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about how you got elected in the first place in 2018. Well, first of all, Guelph's a great place to live and just a, an amazing, uh, progressive, thoughtful community. And I put a lot of hard work in Guelph over the years. I started a couple of businesses there uh, and just, you know, play as, as Ginny Byrne would say, I played the ground game. <laughs> I learned from people like Pat Cerbera, who's from Guelph. I've knocked on more doors in Guelph maybe than any politician in history. And so many one-on-one conversations. Um, I'm very active in the community, doing a lot of volunteer work, everything from you know the Rotary Club to 
anti-poverty groups like Hope House and, and a lot of groups in between. And, and I think I delivered a message and a vision that really resonated with, the, with people in Guelph. And it was mostly around doing politics differently, saying, you know what, I will bring a more collaborative and less confrontational approach to politics. Uh, I will use evidence to make decisions. I talked a lot about the climate crisis, but I did it in the context of creating jobs and growing our economy. And the fact that Guelph has so many clean tech companies and really is a leader in, in you know, the emerging clean economy, uh, I think really resonated with people. And then, you know, I'll be honest with you, David, I mean, the Greens, we have to be strategic. I'm an entrepreneur. And so I really looked at how do we strategically deploy resources to maximize uh, benefit. And so we put a lot of resources into Guelph because we figured, you know, you have to plant a flag somewhere and then you grow from there. That's how the Greens have done it in other provinces like PEI, New Brunswick and British Columbia. And, and we knew that one, given my long history in Guelph and connections to Guelph, the, the demographics and the kind of community Guelph is, that that really was the place to, to go. And then I'll have to say there was a whole bunch of angry liberals that really helped out because you saw a huge shift in the vote uh, from liberal to green uh, between 2014 and 2018. Well, say thank you at least for crazy. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, just out of curiosity, how big a factor was the Nestle water plant in electing your green member in Guelph? You know, I think it played a role, but I, I wouldn't say it was the decisive role. I would say water in general played a huge role. You would be, uh, you would be amazed if you do unprompted polling in Guelph and you ask people what their number one issue is, water oftentimes comes to the top of the list. I mean, if you think about anywhere else in the country would water, maybe other than obviously indigenous communities with boil water advisories, you know, water would be for sure top of the list. But, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's not just Nestle, David, there's actually a quarry right on the edge of Guelph that the city and the province has been in a battle uh, over because the quarry is threatening both the quality and quantity of Guelph's water. And so, the city's been trying to get some restrictions placed on that. And so I ran uh, a you know, letter writing campaign, petition campaigns around protecting Guelph's water. And that's an example. And this is a challenge green space. That's an example of connecting an environmental issue to people's day-to-day -day lives. People recognize that there was a threat to our community's drinking water. We oftentimes have um, uh, reduced water advisories in the summer we're the largest city in Canada that relies solely on groundwater. And so I was able to connect an environmental issue that sometimes for some people can be a bit abstract to their day-to-day -day life. I worked hard on it. I mobilized people around it. And I think I uh, generated a lot of goodwill in the community as somebody who would, you know, go, go to bat for, for Guelph. Okay. Well, that worked. And congratulations. Very impressive. And Thanks. Now, you have launched this week. Uh, a green recovery plan, or was it last week? Sorry. Last week. That's fine. Last week. Green recovery plan. And um, it looks a lot to me like uh, something that nobody on the stage last night wanted to own, the Green New Deal. Um, and uh, so why don't you just quickly walk us through what you are proposing here? Well, first, David, I just want to say that pre pre-COVID, more Canadians worked in green energy than in the oil and gas sector. That is something a lot of people don't realize because those jobs are distributed evenly across the country instead of being concentrated in, in a few locations. And so for me, climate action is an imperative because I want to leave a livable future for my children, but there's an economic imperative to this as well. And so the green and caring recovery we've been proposing, first of all, centers on respect for workers. You know what, I tell you what, this pandemic has shown how vulnerable so many workers are in, in Canada. And we need to ensure we have policies in place such as, you know, let's get rid of sick notes, let's have pay, paid sick leave. Uh, let's ensure that we respect those frontline heroes that, you know, it infuriates me when Doug Ford says, you know, these hero, P his PSWs are heroes, you know, and then he cancels their pandemic pay when we're still in a pandemic. So first of all, we have to treat workers uh, with respect, and that includes people who work in the oil and gas sector. Secondly, we have to 
invest in emerging economies if we're going to markets if we're going to be competitive you know electric vehicles are exploding around the world china uh, is in many ways taking the lead on electric vehicle manufacturing uh, fortunately you know give jerry diaz and unifor credit for you know pushing forward to invest in five evs here in ontario because we are perfectly possession, positioned in ontario to have a mining to manufacturing supply chain we have the rare earth metals, you know, cobalt, nickel, lithium that goes into battery storage, which will be vital to renewable energy, but also to electric vehicle manufacturing. We know how to deploy capital in mining and manufacturing, and we have the manufacturing might in the auto sector to complete the circle and be a global leader. So let's do it. Like that's how we, we that's how we're going to create jobs and remain competitive in a global economy. We know that our buildings are some of the most inefficient buildings in the world. I tell you, this summer on the Economic Recovery Committee, we had so many people from the Ontario home builders to advocacy organizations saying, like, let's have a building retrofit program to improve the energy performance of our buildings, to help people and businesses save money by saving energy. We can create a couple million jobs around the country in, in construction and trade. Those are not jobs you can export to China and Mexico and other low wage uh, jurisdictions. And let's make our buildings the most efficient in the world. Those are the kinds of opportunities where we can create jobs and address the climate crisis. I just talked to you about transportation and buildings, which are two of our largest sources of climate pollution. So let's start there. And then let's make the investments in things like bioproducts and bioplastics that takes advantage of the farming uh, base that we have in Ontario. What does that even to, mean? Sorry, you, that's a that's yeah. that to me that's a, a jargon I don't understand. Bio. Yeah. So, so David, instead of using petrochemicals and thing to make things like plastics, we can use uh, corn-based products. So we can take products off of Ontario's farms, and there are companies uh, in Sarnia right now in Chemical Valley doing this and using farm-based products to provide the basis to. Uh, uh, manufacture chemicals and plastics. And so from an Ontario perspective, or we don't have a lot of petroleum we're producing in Ontario, it's a great way again to create an Ontario supply chain to generate wealth and prosperity in Ontario and to create jobs. So a couple of questions I have. Uh, first of all, it's ambitious. Do you have any idea what it costs? Yeah, so on, on the building front, uh, we've proposed around $5 billion. That would create over a million jobs and allow us to retrofit hundreds of thousands of buildings. By the way, that's almost the exact same amount of money the government is spending on the Liberals' old unfair hydro plan, which made us the only jurisdiction in North America to directly subsidize electricity prices, which is a short-term Band-Aid over a political problem. Why not take that money and invest it in something that's going to create short-term benefits right now in terms of energy savings and job creation, but will provide benefits for decades going forward? That's the kind of smart investments that Ontario needs to make. When I talk about being you know, fiscally prudent, those are smart investments. Throwing a Band-Aid over high electricity prices is, 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 really, is really a short-term a short fix that's not going to provide long-term prosperity or job creation in the province. Uh, on the, on the uh, transportation side of things, uh, you know, for, for... Before we leave buildings, Mike, yeah. before we leave buildings, are you, are you talking about both residential and commercial? And if Absolutely. you are, is residential retrofits an efficient way to achieve climate objectives? Because I... I've seen some residential retrofit programs dating back to the Grant Divine government in Saskatchewan in the 80s, and they often turn out to be boondoggles. Yeah, that's why they have to be designed right, David. And so I'm talking about residential, commercial, uh, and, and public institutions as well. And so the best way to design a residential one is to uh, do what's called a blower door test. You see you know, where, where the energy performance is low at the beginning you do the renovation and in order to qualify for either the tax credits or the grants, you have to show with another blower door test at the end that you've actually uh, made the building more energy efficient. So having, there are, and those are very low cost, you can do this for a couple hundred bucks. So there are low cost ways that you can measure the improvements that are being made. 
And for the homeowner, it's great because it means your, you know, utility bills, your electricity bills and your home heating bills go down and they go down for, for decades going into the future. Your plan is pretty expansive. Your plan includes direct uh, measures for climate like the, re like the retrofits we've just been talking about, but it also includes things like childcare and things mm -hmm. like healthcare. I didn't see a carbon price. <laughs> Well, we certainly support carbon pricing, and I know uh, I've told people from day one that the foundation... What does that mean, Mike? What does that mean? At what level and what kind? Yeah, so my preference in the Green Party's policy is um, very similar to the federal government's program. You put a price on pollution and you provide dividends back to people. I would do it completely different than the way the Trudeau's government, they've buried it in the tax return, so nobody knows they're actually getting a carbon dividend. But if you set Canadians a check, just like the McGuinty government did back when they did the HST transition, I thought that was brilliant. There were all kinds of people upset about the HST. They got their HST check in the mail and suddenly, oh, we're not that upset about the HST anymore. I feel like carbon right. pricing is the exact same way. Put a price on pollution and then um, give uh, a, car a carbon dividend back to every everyone. And then they can use that money to spend on, you know, maybe they want to retrofit their home. Maybe they want to buy a bike and transport that way. Maybe it'll go to their electric vehicle. Uh, for and, and what it does is, is it creates the market incentives that rewards businesses and, co and individuals who lower carbon pollution. Because they know they're going to spend less But not at 40 bucks a ton, it doesn't. Oh, no, it has not to be Not at 40 bucks a ton, higher. it doesn't. It has to be higher. So like what? So you to start... What I would what I would do is you start at like, like if you're talking like, about two hundred or two three hundred dollars, you've got to re redesign the whole tax system, right? You got to do it gradually, David. So you start at you start at forty dollars and you increase at ten percent every year, and you just gradually keep ratcheting it up. We saw how effective that was in British Columbia. They brought it in, the economy continued to grow. Actually, one of the fastest growing economies in Canada. Uh, climate pollution started going down, but then they froze it. And so then, then the benefits of the carbon price were lost. And so that's why you have to just keep gradually ratcheting up. And then you get to a point, uh, and, and the economy responds, if you believe in markets, then the economy is going to respond. Businesses are going to make the right decisions to, to minimize how much they're paying in carbon pricing. Individuals, families, households are going to make the exact same decisions. That's how markets work. And then at some point, hopefully you don't have any more revenue coming in because you've eliminated climate pollution and you have a completely clean economy. Do you see much synchronicity between the federal throne speech and the things you're suggesting? Do you think you and the federal liberals are on the same wavelength on this stuff? I was disappointed in the throne speech, to be honest with you, because uh, when they prorogued, they said, we're going to have this big vision for the country. And this is going to be a transformative throne speech. And I think they failed to deliver that. The one area where I'd say we're very much in sync, I, I was happy to hear about a Canada-wide building retrofit program, uh, because I think it's one of the ways you can tie climate action directly to people's lives. I think it's one of the challenges that the Green Party faces and you know the environmental movement faces is sometimes climate change feels very abstract and sometimes the solutions feel very abstract. But, you know, improving your home, helping your business lower its energy bills, like that is very, you know, you, that you feel directly on your bottom line. So I thought that part of the throne speech was, was effective and good and very much aligned with what the Green Party of Ontario is proposing. But I don't think it was the grand transformative vision that it was billed as uh, in August. Right. What if I said to you that I don't believe that Canadians or people in any country will be prepared to make the kind of sacrifices of standard of living and lifestyle that would be required to reduce global emissions to the point where they need to be by 2050 uh, or 2030 or any number that you choose to pick, that people will wait until it's too late until they're prepared to make the appropriate sacrifices. And so we can bemoan that or we can accept that. And if we accept that, then we have to say, okay, how do we make, and if, if climate change is an immovable object that must be addressed because it's existential, then how do we make it no sacrifice for people? How do we make it so that there isn't a sacrifice we're asking them to make and we're just bloody doing this because we have to save 
the planet. Now, that seemed pretty far-fetched as an idea a year ago, but now that it appears that there's an endless amount of free money available to governments, <laughs> maybe it's not as crazy. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things I'm hoping that changes uh, due to COVID is, you know, if you think back to the Reagan-Thatcher era, and I, I think Ronald Reagan's famous words were, you know, I'm from the U.S. government, and I'm here to help you. That's like the most frightening thing an American could ever hear. Well, I can tell yeah. you during COVID, I think there's a lot of Canadians and Americans are looking to government saying, thank you, government, for coming and providing me with a No question. I've got polling data to prove subsidy. it, Mike. Exactly. So I think people, <clears throat> I, I think the Belief era, in the importance of government in our society yes. is way up. Exactly. So the era of government being ever the problem all the time um, could be over. And we've seen that happen. I mean, the Great Depression and, and World War II and then the New, and the New Deal uh, is an example of that. So we might be in one of those transformative moments. And then I think what we have to do is make sure climate action improves people's lives. I have an electric vehicle. It costs me one-tenth the cost of driving my electric vehicle around than it used to, drive, used to cost me to drive a, a gas-powered car. Uh, yep. I love the fact that downtown Guelph now has a dining district where people can walk around and not have to worry about the, in the streets enjoying themselves. They don't have to worry about being hit by a car, you know? And so I think people want to live in communities that are more walkable and safe for cycling, more people centered uh, with better public transit. Um, I think people will want to live in buildings that are more energy efficient and you see your, your utility bills going down. Um, once you've driven an electric vehicle, and I can tell you this, I grew up on a farm and, you know, I, I loved muscle cars as a high school kid. And now that I've driven an electric vehicle, I never want to go back. Like, I love it. And so we have to come up with ways of saying, you know, we can transform our economy, we can transform our communities, and we can do it in a way that improves the quality of your life and avoids the climate crisis we're facing I mean, look at what we've gone through with COVID, David. Like, nobody wants to go through this. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's been a pretty tough seven months. And, you know, can you imagine having, and, you know, what we've seen in California this year and Oregon and Washington, what we saw in Australia last year, some of the flooding we've seen in Toronto. I mean, my gosh, there was a day uh, last year in August where I think we, we had $80 million worth of infrastructure damage in, in Toronto in three hours due to an intense rainstorm. That's the tip of the iceberg of the cascading effects of what the climate crisis is going to look like. The disruption to our life, the deterioration of our quality of life, the, the devastation to our economy is going to be real. It's going to be painful. And the more we can do right now to avoid that and do it in a way that actually improves the quality of your life, you know, that, that's the challenge we have. And, and I think people are ready to embrace that and and look to government as being part of the solution it's not the only part of the solution but it, it government has to play a vital role because this is a collective problem and we have to address it collectively and the best way to do that is democratically and that's where government comes in okay speaking of democracies what do you think is going to happen in the next ontario provincial election well you, you know as well as i do how can you predict a provincial election a year and a half out, especially when we're in the most extraordinary times any of us have ever, uh, ever experienced. So uh, I think it's, it's hard to call right now. Uh, I mean, obviously every party is getting ready. Uh, and, and I feel like green. When do you in, think in it a, is Mike? Do you think it's this spring? Do you think they're going to push it early? I think it would be a mistake for them to push it early. Uh, I know uh, the liberals are trying to push them on that question uh, in the house. Uh, but, you know, given where the COVID numbers are going and what the economic implications of that would be, I think the ship has sailed on governments calling early elections to take advantage of high poll numbers. And I also think that the fact that, you know, in New Orleans, Morgan's the they, last guy to get in a, under the wire on that, I think. Exactly. And, he, and even with Oregon, it may have been too late. Who knows? Mm. Uh, we'll see where the numbers go between now and I think with their election of October 26, I think. I mean, there's a lot of public health ex experts saying that it's around then is when you're going to see this, the, the next spike in, in COVID right. numbers. So we'll see. But um, I think it'd be a huge mistake for them to pull the plug early. I, I don't. And so, you know, 
obviously we have to contingency plan for that, but you know, I'm thinking it, it will be the fixed election date and in June of 2022, and we'll be ready. And I'm excited because I think we're going to grow the number of seats uh, the Ontario Greens have, because I think people have felt that I've been effective. I mean, I think a lot of people thought, what can one person do in the Ontario legislature? You're never going to hear from this person. And I feel like I've been very effective as an opposition member holding the government accountable, but I've also shown ways that I can work with them. And I've taken some heat for that. I mean, I, I passed a private member's bill with a member of the Conservative Party to benefit electric vehicles. And I can tell you the NDP was not happy about that. Like, why would you work with somebody? But I feel like in the, in the conservatives, and I feel like, you know, my job is, is I can hold government accountable. I can be very critical of, you know, Doug Ford's made to fail climate plan. But if I can move the needle forward by working with somebody in, in the premier's caucus, then I'm going to do that because that's what I was elected do, to do to get things done. What are the next five green seats in Ontario? You know, I, I think we show a lot of strength in, in the Guelph region. And, and if you look at how green parties have grown in, in other provinces, so I look at PEI, New Brunswick, and BC, you know, you sort of, you've got that one, that one riding and then you grew out from that riding. I think our experience will be very similar. So the, you know, Guelph, Wellington, Waterloo region, I think going up around to Perry Sound, Muskoka, we've, we've had very uh, strong poll numbers in those areas. And I'm in conversations now, I think, with some high-profile candidates in some other parts of the province that uh, if we can leverage their popularity and their name recognition with, I think, the effective job uh, I've done or, you know, and the team around me, it's a green team around me, the green team is done in the legislature, I, I'm confident we're going to translate that into additional seats. Cool. There's a federal leadership race on right now in your party. Coming to the close of that race, have you been supporting anybody? David, I've decided to remain neutral. I just decided there there are a number of lame, really, lame, lame, lame. <laughs> lame. <laughs> there are a number. There are a number of really good. There are a number of really good candidates, David, who um, <laughs> I can see working with. And I have a number of the people around me. It's interesting. The, the people around me are, are almost split between three of them. And so I just figured it was better for me to stay neutral. Um, David Coote in New Brunswick, Peter Bevan Baker in PEI, uh, Elizabeth May obviously all made the same decisions. And, uh, you know, I, I will work with whoever the next leader is. And uh, I'm excited. I mean, I think it's, this has been good for the Green Party of Canada to have a leadership race. Elizabeth May created a, an incredibly strong foundation for the party, and now it's time for another leader to come and take it to the next level. So my observation about the Green campaign in the last federal campaign was that it was a really missed opportunity, and that at the start of that campaign, with the NDP weakness um, and with uh, climate change at a pretty high level of uh, public interest at the time, just dissipated somewhat because of COVID, but very high interest at the time, that there was a real opportunity for the Greens, even to perhaps surpass the NDP, I thought, at the beginning of the campaign. And as a as a hack, I'll just say to you, I mean, you are operate at a different level of policy and, and, uh, and uh, governance. But as a hack, I would say, I don't see the professionalism in the Green Party as a campaign operation that allows it to take advantage of its opportunities. And I think that you could see that in almost every aspect of the federal green campaign last time. Um, and, you know, you can have great candidates and great leaders. Um, but if you, if you can't raise money and if you can't advertise and if you can't determine what a clear message is, and I, I, mean, I know this is a long question, but I'm interested by what I saw as the intellectual center-left coherence of your green recovery plan. And I don't know that anybody has ever had a really clear, coherent sense of what the Green Party federally stands for. Um, and so uh, I guess all I'm saying is, do you see any of that changing? And is the Green Party willing to professionalize itself as a political operation? Because there seemed to be almost some willful amateurishness about it. Yeah, I think this leadership contest will, will give you a, a partial answer to that question. There are some folks running uh, who, you know, are 
running as eco-socialists and at the same time attacking union leaders <laughs> in the country. And there are other people who I think are, are running as pragmatic Greens with a very progressive, bold vision for the country. And uh, the party members are going to decide that direction. I can tell you in the case of the Green Party of Ontario, I am focused on building a, a bold yet pragmatic party. And I think it's the entrepreneur in me. I mean, if you're going to start a business or you know, start a few businesses like I have, you have to be bold. <laughs> you have to you know, have that vision of where you want to go. But you also have to be pragmatic about how you're going to get there. You have to figure out you know, how you're going to capitalize it, resource it, uh, plan out the steps and, and, and be professional about it. And that's exactly what the Green Party of Ontario has done. I mean, I think one of the things we've been able to do, and I've seen this with, in British Columbia with the BC Greens and in PEI New Brunswick with the Greens there as well, is to be bold, visionary and transformative, but do it in a very pragmatic way where people where you can almost, it's like leading people across a bridge. Like we, we have to bridge into the next economy and address climate. But you have to kind of hold people's hands and walk them across that bridge. You just can't throw them out into the water and say swim. And, and that's what the bold yet pragmatic approach is. And that's exactly what we're doing with the, with the Green Party of Ontario. And I feel like, I feel like we're a very professional operation. I mean, I, I would, you know, ask you to go talk to, you know, some of your old buddies back at Queens Park, and and uh, I think they would say that, you know, what we're on top of things. We run a professional organization, and for a party of one, I think we punch well above our weight. Right. What do you have to say to conservative voters? I mean, if we're going to really get a durable consensus, I mean, we had, for instance, we had a cap and trade plan then we change governments, we don't have a cap-and-trade plan. If we're going to have a durable climate plan that lasts election after election until we win this battle, we're going to need to convince conservatives to do something about climate change and to be committed to continuing these policies when they win time in government. So do you see yourself as appealing really only to liberal and, and NDP voters, or do you have a message that you think can resonate with conservative voters. Yeah, David, you've asked a really important question here because if we're going to address the climate crisis, it's going to take it in the kind of transformative change it's going to take. It's going to take a broad societal coalition, which will include conservatives. It, it, will, it will have to, otherwise it won't be the enduring change that we need. And so, you know, I think I was able to connect with a number of conservatives in Guelph because of my business oriented message around, you know, we can attract capital investment, we can create jobs, we can, we can lower operating costs by being more energy efficient. Uh, and so I think the challenge I have now is how do I take that beyond one riding? It's one thing to dig deep into your community and be really connected with people there and, to, you know, have a business background there and say, okay, you know, we, we know this person and, you know, we, you know, we understand it's a bold vision, but it's pragmatic. So the challenge I face now is how do we translate that in, you know, to the rest of the province where you can't, you know, dig as deep, right? And that's going to take resources. So, you know, I've spent a, I've spent a lot of time <clears throat> focused on fundraising and, and, you know, getting in, bringing in the resources to the party. And I'm spending a lot of time right now networking with people uh, across the province who I think can bring credibility to our message, but I think we have to show, and it's not going to be all conservative voters, because I can tell you, the conservative coalition has climate deniers in it, and no matter what I say, they're not going to listen. But there are there's a broad swath of the of the conservative coalition that recognizes we have to address climate. They just want to make sure we do it in a way that you know ensures their businesses will be profitable, that we'll have job creation, and that we're not going to destroy the economy. And so my challenge is to talk about the ways in which you know, we can create jobs, we can be fiscally prudent, we can attract capital investment. And, and, um, and, and, you know, countries around the world, I mean, Germany is showing you can do that. I mean, even China right now, the amount of capital investment they're bringing into electric vehicle manufacturing and renewable energy. Uh, but also you know, you, coal plants, right? 
Yes, they do. But I mean, also they have lots of problems, David. Don't, I'm not, but I'm just saying that <clears throat> we have to compete in that. What? Kind first, of- you fly the Chinese flag yesterday, and now you're <laughs> defending their climate policies. You le- Ontario legislators, <laughs> my God. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to say here, David, is, is I want to outcompete them. I want to outcompete them. I don't want that right. capital investment going there. I want it coming to Ontario because we have the foundation to do it. Okay. This has been so much fun. We're almost out of time, but I cannot let you go without asking you about what was on television last night? <laughs> Did you watch the U.S. presidential debate last night, Mike? So, David, I, I don't think you're subject to CRTC regulations, are you? No, because fire that away, a, brother. <laughs> that was a complete shit show. Oh, oh my, my I don't God. even know what that was. I So, I, I don't know, most of your listeners probably don't. I grew up in the States. I'm a farm boy from rural western Kansas, so I... I feel your Saskatchewan prairie boy uh, background I can, I can relate to. And last night I was just thinking, like, I am so thankful I've become a Canadian <laughs> because I am, I'm worried about the U.S. You know, that was just unbelievable. Uh, and and what, what really worries me is, is that it has huge implications for Canada. You know, our society, our economy is so connected to the U.S., and, and, you know, I, I mean, just Trump sowed chaos and it was just, it was, it was complete bully attacking chaos and Biden looks so low energy <laughs> and, and in some respects to his defense, um, you know, it's amazing what he's been able to do to overcome his stuttering pro- challenge. But I, I could feel it last night where there were times where he just couldn't get the words out quick enough to deal with just the bombs that Trump was throwing at him. And, and, right. you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, as anybody, it was always a problem, but it's worse now that he's turned 117. Well, there is that one. Well, I keep thinking like so yeah. the U S is this huge country. It's a wealthy country. Can you find mm. anybody to be your president who might be in their fifties or sixties and not, you know, you know <laughs> reti- past retirement age? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It'll be an, it's going to be an interesting uh, month of October. We'll put it that way. I think that country is in a dark place. It is. What's it the is. matter it's with really Kansas sad. has become, what's the matter with a lot of places? Yeah. Yeah. And I can tell you, I, I grew up in Trump country and I, I my dad's passed away, David, and, and uh, passed away way too young. And I keep thinking what my dad would think right now, because he was a conservative, but he also believed in honesty he believed in paying your taxes. He believed that you had to serve your community. Like he was on the school board and the hospital board. And Trump is just Those so used to be Republican values. And Trump yeah. is, is the complete opposite of all that. And so I, 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 I oftentimes, my mom was very progressive. She was a school teacher. And so I was in this like, you know, split household I grew up in. And, and my mom and I both talk about like, I don't know how my dad would, re- would respond to Trump. Because everything about Trump's life and his business dealings are the complete opposite of the way my dad did business. But yet somehow Republicans still continue to support this guy. Yeah. Well, uh, it will be an interesting November and I presume December. And Trump will let us know that it's going to get interesting right until he walks right out the door. So well, it'll be interesting, you but, know, um, George Washington set the precedent for a peaceful transfer of power in the U.S. And no president has, has really ever questioned that. And now we have a president openly questioning it. Yeah, no, I mean, you think of how Gore handled something that was legitimately contestable versus how Trump is threatening to handle this. Anyway, it has been great to have you on. I am thrilled that you are out there fighting for environmental and climate issues and you're a great guy and i wish you the best of luck well david it's been fun and i just want to thank you and jenny and scott when i when i go for one of my long bike rides you give me something to listen to that i can enjoy so thank you (laughs) thank you very much for that okay take care bye now stay safe bye you too broadly speaking companies reacted in two ways when it became obvious last spring that covid19 was going to change everything. Some went into a defensive crouch when business dried up. They took whatever help government was offering and hoped for a cure. 
Others got to work. They coped and they adapted and they kept the economy moving. CN was one of those companies. The railway triggered its pandemic emergency plan early on. Some employees even volunteered to mix sanitizer and assemble protective kits for colleagues who load and operate trains. Instead of parking locomotives when business dropped, CN identified customers providing essential services, say farmers and food distributors, and redeployed empty trains to serve them. CN's grain shipments this year actually set records. If you wondered during the lockdown how food shelves remained full, well, let's say it was no coincidence. It was a massive, urgent movement of people and equipment. And a few months ago, in what's fair to describe as a time of insecurity, CN decided to spend nearly $3 billion upgrading its system, plowing investment money into nearly every region in Canada. Because, you see, CN really didn't have a choice. It had to step up. There's nothing more essential to Canada's economy than the railroad. And when you have that kind of responsibility, you can't go into hibernation when an emergency arrives. You have to meet it head on. That's what CN did. Hey, it's the panel. Jenny, Scott, you guys, it's great to have you back. Hi. Hello. Hi. All right, Jenny, how are you? I'm doing great. What's new? Tell us something new about yourself. Um, nothing really new. Work. I uh, watched the debate last night. Lots of politics happening uh, 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 south of the border in here. So uh, getting my uh, fix uh, that way. Yeah. yeah, you're opening. You have a new office opening, right? Uh, we do. We've been in the office for a few weeks now. Uh, it's a uh, these things always end up taking uh, longer to get set up than what uh, than what you anticipate. But, uh, you know, we've got working TVs and Wi-Fi and, and uh, it's uh, it's really good. Can you sell musical instruments? Is that, <laughs> it's like a rare guitar shop. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Uh, you, I don't think anybody's going into offices though. I was, let me tell you a story for those people who understand Toronto. I, when I was in Toronto for a couple of weeks, I had to take my dog from my house at King and front, uh, sorry, Bathurst and front to uh, Davenport and Young. And Waze told me that the quickest way to do that last week at 8.30 in the morning was to take Adelaide to Bay Street and then turn north. In other words, to drive right into the heart of the business district and use that as your route to get somewhere. That, and it was true. The place was empty. Some people are starting to come back. I, I, I probably have now three to four meetings a week in person. I've had meetings. Yes. I've had people ask for meetings. But uh, I've also had people ask for meetings and then uh, cancel them. Um, or, like I had people asking for meetings two weeks ago, and in the last five days, people started canceling them. And then I, my, my, um, my kid's school, there was an outbreak at. So my um, kids had to get tested. They tested negative. And technically, I'm under no restrictions or anything. But I've, I've punted all my meetings as a consequence since, and now we're going to be in person. Said, let's just wait until his ISO period is over just to be on the safe side. I don't want to – like I like to lick people in meetings. Uh, so yeah. I figure I want to wait until they can get the full effect. I don't want to half-ass my uh, in, in-person Scott Reed Act. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's something that neither Jenny nor I miss from the in-person in, uh, Hurley Burley. <laughs> He's like, Scooby-Doo! <laughs> so last night was the U.S., the first uh, and perhaps last, the way people are talking. It was supposed to be the first of three, but it might be the last U.S. presidential debate. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think that... Uh, in terms of the overall comportment of the debate and management of the debate, a lot has been said. I'm going to use my time here, though, for a particular takeaway that may or may not be wrong. And one of the things that's frustrating about doing this is that right now, there are people who work for both of those candidates who know exactly what happened last night in the public domain, and we don't. So we're speculating and there are people who had real-time focus groups last night and overnight polling who have a real idea of what happened. But I, I have a thesis, and I'm going to present it to you, which is that the only thing that mattered last night is whether impressions of Joe Biden changed. Um, and that was true going in, because I believe that Trump's number is fixed. 
that Trump's attitudes about Trump are 100% baked in. And nobody's altering their view of him. The question is whether they alter their view of Biden and whether they alter their view of Biden down enough that Trump becomes a better choice for them. And so despite the uh, wild behavior of Trump last night that many people, commentators, are expecting will turn people off of him. He was behaving in a way that would turn people off of him, but he was up against somebody who was helpless in the face of that barrage and that assault. He was up against somebody in Biden who looked like uh, he was being dominated by Trump and looked too old and too inarticulate to adequately defend himself. And so the conclusion that I reached watching it is that there was one alpha on the stage, one clear alpha male on the stage, and that in a very primal way of voting, I'm trying to think of an example where Americans chose the non-alpha of the two candidates in order to be their president. And so my fear is, to sum it all up, that last night Biden looked too weak, old, and frail for too many people. And that uh, we always think of debates looking for a nice, crisp exchange in which somebody wins and somebody loses. That's rarely how debates are settled. They're mostly settled through messy, ongoing messy exchanges that are difficult to discern and people talking over each other, even in Canadian debates. But at the end of it, people have formed an impression. People have taken uh, an overall impression away. And my fear is that last night they would have seen Trump being an asshole, but that's baked in. But the other guy, I don't know if he measured up. Either of you want to go? I'll yeah, reply first because I, I think Jenny may be more on your side. So I'll um, I'll go second and you guys can sandwich me. I I think your analysis is correct, but I think your conclusion is wrong. And, and obviously, I hope that it's wrong. So maybe that's confirmation bias. I also worry that you may be exhibiting a little confirmation bias because you and I have talked many times about our concern that Biden does look like a doddering old man. And, you know, uh, and as much as he did... Uh, look passive uh, in the face of uh, the lawnmower that was Donald Trump last night. Um, he actually didn't have a moment where, you know, he wandered around and said, where's my sweater? It's after eight. I want my sweater. I'm cold now. You know, like he didn't, he, I didn't think he went full Grandpa Simpson. So my, my take is that um, he, Biden lost the debate, but I don't think he lost the night. And I think we may be underestimating uh, how turned off um, any voter that isn't already with Trump would have been by the spectacle of it. Yes, he was alpha. He was fully alpha. I was surprised he didn't just wander over, lift his hind leg and piss right down Biden's pant leg, right? He was being that alpha with him. But it was such a flaming cistern of shit. I just think that many, you know, you think about the voters, but if he's six, seven percent behind in key swing states in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, you know, maybe some of them are only three or four. He needs suburban voters. He needs suburban women voters. I think a lot of people turned that debate off after 25 minutes and said, I can't, I can't, I can't bear this. Like it was it wasn't just Trump being Trump. It was Trump turned up to 11. And I think it turned the whole thing, you know, to, to borrow CNN's phrase, into such a shit show that um, that people repelled to it. And I think that it... Biden failed to seize opportunities to, and it drove me crazy. And, and maybe we can talk a bit more about that because there's a bunch of things that I, I hope that he will do in the next couple of weeks that he didn't do last night. But ultimately, I'm not convinced that losing the debate means he lost the night because I think that people are going to recoil in it, that it's still going to dig in the general trends, which is some people want that carnival barker and uh, a slight majority want change. And he told them last night why they want change because he's such an obnoxious 
prick. And by the way, there wasn't a bit of message there for people. There wasn't a single thing if you're concerned about public health care, uh, pu- uh, I mean, COVID response. There wasn't a single thing if you're worried about the economy. It wasn't a single thing for you to latch onto from either one of those guys. It was but, all just pissing in each other's face. But, so um, I'm not sure that Trump won. I think that the whole thing turns out to be a, uh, a non-event clusterfuck. Well, to your point about there not being any policy, the debate was designed uh, specific, almost specifically not to discuss policy. Chris Wallace was a terrible moderator. He couldn't get things under control. And you can talk about mics, you can talk about whatever. Um, but half the time he spent more time talking. Each of the, when he would do his leadoff question, uh, he spoke for almost two minutes himself in terms of uh, uh, doing the uh, 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 doing the question. So I don't think either candidate, I actually don't blame either of them for not getting out substantive uh, policy. I think that if most voters turned off after a half an hour, Scott, I think that uh, that would have been bad for the Biden campaign because I think that uh, I do think overall Trump won the debate. I think he accomplished what he wanted to. I don't think, I don't think anyone like, is it a shock to anyone after the last five years that Donald Trump is rude and interrupts and comes across as a bit of a bully? Absolutely not. He, he did that to Hillary. Remember when he prowled behind her during, um, uh, during the one debate, I don't think he, he cares. I, I, I like it. So he accomplished what he want, wanted. I'm not sure Biden did to both of your points. He looked old. He looked Botoxed, like, like, bad Wayne Newton, Kenny Rogers, rest in peace, Kenny, uh, Botoxed. Um, uh, and, and he got frustrated early on, like when he started the, you know, shut up, man, and keep yapping, man. I wanted to hear the come on, man. Um, I, I was waiting for it. I, we never. Uh, Here's the deal. Here's the deal. <laughs> Um, and I think that there were opportunities he missed. I think that his hands were tied in terms of talking about law and order in places like Kenosha and Portland. His, his hands have been tied by the uh, the, real, the left wing of the, the Democratic Party. I think at the end when they started talking about uh, uh, voter fraud and mail-in ballots, that was a good opportunity for him to uh, turn around and say, OK, well, if you lose, what is going to be the transition for power? Because I think most people, even if they're Trump supporters, it, it leaves them extremely uncomfortable that he's talking about, well, I could lose this election and I'm not, I'm not leaving. So I think that was a real missed opportunity for um, uh, Biden at the end. I have a whole host of other thoughts, but in a nutshell, that's, I think that if any of them accomplished what they needed to do, um, Trump accomplished for his supporters um, uh, what they needed to do. But I don't think the average undecided voter um, probably came away with anything new or, or, you know, like I think Trump's supporters uh, say he's he's won and he shows he's the alpha dog, David, to your point. Uh, and Biden supporters say Trump's a bully and this will turn female voters off and we've won. But see, I, I want to just, to me, the critical issue, I think we're all three agreeing in doing, one respect. If, if you're doing polling right now, you're going deep into the underliers. You're not looking for the top line response to this, right? You were watching focus groups last night to see body language and see reactions as shots from people. And you were are looking in your data today to see how character attributes of the two people have changed as a consequence. And of course, with all these debates, it's today and tomorrow's media coverage and social media coverage that also affect very dramatically how people will, have, even though I presume that there was a large audience last night, many more people will learn about it, of course, from the amplification. And I'm interested to see what clips they choose. Well, the uh, story of the debate, use deals for the story of the debate was shit show. Um, and, and I think it's still shit show today. And, and I think that saves Biden a little bit um, because I think that Biden did lose the debate, couldn't get his messages out, couldn't articulate himself clearly and did not appear like a strong leader. But if shit show is the story, the underlying trend I'd be looking for in the polling data for the next few days is a hardening of the desire for change. Like, does it does it harden that because people go, okay, this is this is what I need less of this this total uh, fuck show, right? Like, I can't, I gotta get, I gotta get less of this. I gotta get people who are gonna tell me what they're gonna do about my health care. They're gonna tell me what they're gonna do about COVID, and they're gonna tell me what they're gonna do about getting my job back. And um, if I was Biden, I'd move immediately in this next couple of days to do in a controlled way, which clearly is the only way he can do it in a controlled way to put forward, here are my five decisions I'll make in the first uh, 10 days of my presidency. Here's what I'm going to do. And make that the plan that he didn't present last night as a contrast to the inaction of Trump and the, and the theater of Trump. Um, because Biden ain't going to win this on Biden. He's going to have to win it on desire to get rid of Trump and comfort with 
a more coherent plan going forward. It ain't about Biden. He sucks. He's not going to be good. He's never been good. Now he's not good and he's old. It's a shit combination, but it's what the anti-Trump forces have dealt themselves in the country that is the United States. Jenny, should he do a second debate? Some people are saying Biden should just walk away from these debates now and say, I'm not going to do these things. There's two more scheduled. Should he do them? But but if he if he if he doesn't do it, it looks like he's he's it, it, to me then he's a, their campaign is admitting he's lost. If he if if he can't hold his own in a structure like like that, um, then how is he going to be able to run the country? Like if he can't actually off the cuff debate Donald Trump, who all of his naysayers say, oh, he's stupid and he's this. So if if jo- if if Joe Biden can't uh, debate debate this who they ca- they call this stupid incompetent guy for an hour and a half, how does that? How is that a win for him? It actually means that he's lost this debate. So I don't think his campaign, uh, I don't think his campaign can can do that. They've just got to find a way that he doesn't get drawn in. Like, obviously, uh, Trump had a strategy. His strategy last night was knowing that Biden was going to be extremely scripted, to Scott's point, because he can't do anything else but. And we could tell when he was pointing his fingers and when he was doing this at the camera, you know that the, his people worked with him on that for weeks, probably. So when 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 Trump is 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 trying to, to to turn the debate into the Supreme Court or chirping him about his son and what have you, that throws Biden off. And so that was an objective that I think that um, that 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 Trump did purposely. But I think that if Joe Biden and the Democrats refuse the, to do the next two debates, uh, it, it it is send, sending a signal that he is he lost the debate and he is too weak to be able to take on Donald Trump. And I think that's deadly for him. I'd be awfully tempted to consider saying, unless unless the moderator can kill mics in order to establish order. Because, Jenny, you said Chris Wallace did an awful job last night, and I think I agree. But I'm not sure that there is a person on the planet, short of Charles Xavier, who could have exerted mind control and silenced the candidates, that would have been able to establish order. So it would be tempting for the Democrats to say, unless the moderator is given a, uh, the ability to kill mics, we won't participate in another uh, one of these gong shows. But ultimately, I... I Does that sound be, whiny? Yeah. Ultimately, I would be too afraid of of doing that if I were them. Ultimately, I would be like Penny. Like it or not, you <laughs> illustrative of what kind of president you will be or not. You're in a process that requires you to go nose to nose with this alpha dog. So you've got to stand there and bark back. And I just think um, I, I, as tempting as it is to get out of the junkyard uh, with that dog. I think it would be a mistake. I, I think they have to go forward in these next two debates. Uh, exactly. And so I think if you're the Democrats, you were sitting back last night going, fuck, how did we end up in this situation? How did we oh. walk ourselves into having uh, this guy be the best possible guy to take on um, uh, to take on Trump? You know, they, they, they settled on him, right? I mean, the guy wasn't well, winning. They, they it tried wasn't like he was winning the primary. They just all pulled out and said, in yeah. order to stop Bernie, we're left with this. So yeah. we'll take the middle of the road, 1970s Democrat. But, you know, I've told, David knows the story. You know, and, and when Paul was prime minister, we went down to Washington in 2005 and we had a day long set of meetings with um, President Bush and Cheney and everybody and Condi Rice at the White House. But then we also did a second day, a half day at Congress. In one of the sessions, we got called in, you know, we went in and sat down, you know, like the, uh, you know, the Senate room in, um, you know, that that Senate room they have in uh, in Godfather Part 2, you know, where they're like, you know, Senator, I think you owe Michael Corleone an apology. <laughs> you know that room? Like, so we're in that room, right? And Biden is sitting up there. We're like Corleone, right? Uh, and and uh, we're sitting down and we're looking up at him. He's up in the dais or whatever he is and he comes in and he talks and he talks and he talks and paul like leans over and like writes on a piece of paper to me he's like is this guy ever shut the fuck up like it's just on and on and on right this is 15 years ago and he's talking about canada it's like hey asshole we're from canada we know all about it okay <laughs> thanks we don't need <laughs> no more no more right i could go to the encyclopedia or look out my window i know about canada so telling us what you know about the place that we come from is impressive but enough 
And that's who he is. And he blew himself up in 1988. He blew himself up in the Obama primary. He uh, was losing this primary until circumstances conspired to pluck him out of the end of the pack and put him at the front. Uh, and he sucked in. And, and so this is what they chose. So I think they've got to go forward with the next two debates. I think they should count their blessings that COVID occurs, and that means that he can run a campaign from his basement. I think they should go with select ads, have a couple of very orchestrated appearances where he's interacting with small groups of people, looks gentlemanly, looks avuncular, and just pray to Christ they can shuffle, literally shuffle like an old man in a cardigan across the finish line on November 3rd, because this guy isn't going to carry any campaign on his back. So sad. Just for fun. Just for fun. What would Bernie Sanders have done with Trump last night? <laughs> well, that would have been Grandpa uh, Simpson, don't you think? Yeah, he would have been. They'd have been. He would have been yeah, able to ahead. fight. He would have been able to fight back on on his feet a bit more. I think he would have gotten into yeah. the weeds and stuff in terms of defund the police and and what have you, and gone really to the left, which is obviously what Biden's campaign is 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 trying not to to do. Um, but he would have been he would have been able to kind of take him on, um, take him on more. Because Scott, if your point is that I. Uh, you know, the objective has to be uh, that, you know, small, small events run the campaign from his basement on the computer with the Zoom that he shares with Jill, because every once in a while he's got to get off the Zoom because Jill needs to use it for work. Um, uh, then uh, th then they can do that. But if you notice on some of the chirping that, that Trump did, it was, you know, uh, you can't run a campaign like that. People don't want to see you. Like all that chirping, whether people like it or not, it is setting up a narrative that if that's exactly what Biden does, uh, that narrative is going to be out there whether people whether people like it or not. I think it was all sure. very purposeful. Like, but it's not that strong a narrative. Not, not in comparison to the narrative that David uh, that Donald Trump unleashes on a daily basis with um, with incompetence and incoherence. Like he's not Donald Trump of 2016. I hated the guy then, but at least in 2016. He would have said, build the wall, right? Return those manufacturing jobs to America. He would have said that 30 times, right? And uh, and he didn't say any of those. Like, he has no coherence. Um, but there was but that Bernie, well, wait a second. That, wait a, wait, wait a was, second. Wait. That, that debate wasn't well, coherent ahead, for Jim. any of them to be able to. Like, that's that's not fair to say that. Let's see what the next two, well, like, that is. But that's it's true not of this whole campaign. But he, he, he did get out. Well, he's also the, the, he's also the president. So he now has to actually defend a record which he never had to do uh which but he never had to do before and but he did but get wait a second examples. he got messages out scott you're not being fair he got messages out i saw three real wedges that trump drove into biden and i'm going to see how they play one of them is he got biden to say that he'd roll back the trump tax cuts yes see how that plays that's an ad. second thing is second thing is he got biden to say that biden does not support the green new deal We'll see what the Republicans do with that to suppress turnout for the Democrats. And he got uh, he, he, he got Biden in a situation where Biden wouldn't say law and order um, and looked like he was a little shivvy on the whole issue about uh, about policing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I agree there's no clean exchange. But I heard those things through all that mess and noise. I heard those right. things. I don't, I don't, I don't care don't about deny those that. things. I just, but I presume some voters do. Joe, no, no, Joe, I got done more in forty-seven months than you did in forty-seven years. Yeah, I, that's a politics line that we like, but and people package up for clips. But I, you know, I, again, I, I'm just not convinced. Those are good wedges, and he's not been successful at landing those wedges you know what i if i was the biden campaign i'd be so frustrated about the law and order section right you know like if they have done a very shrewd job of insulating themselves on that the speech the biden gave you know where he called for law and order um he's said no to defund the police early on so they've tried to insulate themselves very shrewdly on that and he undid 60 percent of it last night by just literally uh looking slow on the switch when the subject came up last night but again i don't think those narratives are as powerful as the overall narrative which is we got to get rid of this asshole and get uh get some stability if it had been bernie sanders by the way i just want to go back to your question because i think it's an interesting one i think it's the exact opposite of this if it had been Bernie Sanders, I think that he would have had a shot at winning the debate, but he would have lost the election. Because the way that Bernie Sanders would win the debate, right, he'd be like, he'd be giving as good as he gets, right? Like he's got the full crazy Doc Brown thing going, 
We're going to you know, we're gonna get your tax returns. We're going to gather up you, your family, and all your rich friends. We're going to roast you and eat you for dinner, you motherfucker. Right? Woo! Fight the power, right? So he would have done that, and people would have cheered and all that stuff. And they would have said, well, he got the better of Trump in the debate. But he, people, all, all those suburban moms in Ohio and Florida would have gone, yikes. So there's a reason the Dems, as much as it puzzles me and I'm frustrated by Biden, there's a reason they picked this kind of candidate. They pick this place in the spectrum. So they got it. They got to stick with it. That's why I say it's about shuffling this thing over the line on November 3rd. It ain't about, you know, like the, imagining what Bernie Sanders would do in this campaign. I mean, the reason we have Biden is because Bernie Sanders was in that campaign. They had to stop that. They had to stop Doc Brown. Right. Right. All right. Jenny, any last words on Trump before we move on? No, nope, I don't. Good. All right. So, COVID. Yeah, I heard in the introduction that I'm back up at the lake here. Had two weeks in Toronto. and uh, But uh, I felt like I was getting out of Toronto just in time because the cases were shooting back up. We had a relatively better day yesterday in Ontario, at least on cases. But we'll see what, uh, we'll see what today brings. But in any event, it feels to me like we are at a new and really precipitous place on COVID because it feels like there is, is as much of it around as there ever was in April or May. Um, and it feels like uh, uh, there is uh, no willingness on the part of the population to take the actions that were taken in the spring uh, to deal with it. And it feels like governments, uh, both federal and provincial, are losing credibility with the public rapidly um, and are losing their ability to use the bully pulpit to enforce behavior. Uh, so to me, uh, we could be, we, it feels to me like we're headed for a herd immunity um, outcome. I'm not sure about that. I think governments, uh, well, I think governments would, would try to lock down, maybe not to the, to the degree we were locked down for mid-March to mid-April, but I think the governments are, are looking to uh, are looking to lock down here in Ontario, here in Toronto, especially. Um, uh, I have the same feeling I had kind of the last week of February, the first week of March, that it's just, I keep saying there's no way it's going to happen. Nobody will actually do this, but that that's where it's kind of going, going to, I, I, I saw today that uh, the only, by the time this, the podcast is, is broadcast, there's going to be six, the, the numbers for today in Ontario are 625 cases. I don't know what the hospitalizations are. The hospitalizations are only sitting yesterday. They were at 138. Um, with uh, 20 people, I believe, on uh, on ventilators. So um, I, I I agree with you that the goodwill in terms of the governments are wearing thin, and I think that's across the board. And I think uh, and 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 David, I think we've talked about this before. Um, the, the reason being is because uh, for the first few months, when it was all very new to us, and uh, no one really knew what what to expect. Uh, that people were willing to give, give kind of the benefit of the doubt to governments in terms of being caught flat-footed. But that's been seven months now. Like, we've essentially been in, in this for seven months. And I think that there was an expectation by people across the country and across different provinces uh, that governments were spending that six months uh, preparing for the second wave that healthcare officials and that themselves uh, talked about. And now it's seemingly we're sitting here in October and schools are open and businesses are open and people are trying to go on with their lives because, um, I, you know, Economic, small businesses are hurting and what have you, uh, that it's come to the conclusion that for the most part, governments have not done anything over the course of the last six and a half months uh, to prepare uh, for this, uh, for, for where we're at now. And I think there are exceptions. I think that John Horgan, even though we're in an election in BC, uh, and we can talk about that later, I think uh, that province has has done well. I think that Jason Kenney in Alberta has uh, has uh, has done well. They, they don't have the testing problems that, um, uh, that we see in, in uh, uh, in other places, I think uh, the two governments I would say that are kind of in the most trouble right now uh, with with people are probably uh, uh, Lego in Quebec and Ford in uh, Ontario for obvious reasons. I'm less pessimistic than you, Dave. What was working for Ford in the spring that's not working for him now? Why doesn't the same shtick work now? Well, so well, I think there's a couple of things. I think that it's um, it's become the environment as opposed to being a, a, a novelty situation. Like there was a fire drill aspect to February, March, and April where people were like, okay, it's a fire drill. We got to pay attention. We're supposed to line up to the right. And Ford was there going, hey, folks, 
right? To the right, let's go, follow me out. And so people were like, okay, that's good. That's what he's doing what I want. Now we're months and months into this thing. The fire drill aspect of it, the problem may be just as prevalent, but the fire drill aspect of it, the emergency aspect of it, that sense of uh, of emergency, I think, is, has abated. I don't agree with you, though. I think people will still defer to government uh, on this broad stuff. I don't think you're going to see Quebec rebel against the uh, harsh measures that Legault has had to take harsh measures Legault has had to take because I think they've had far too casual and half-assed a, an approach to this thing uh, in the first run. But I do think what will be lost, so I still think the government can um, say to people, you're going to have to take these measures and by and large, people will follow them uh, in response to 625 cases and so forth. I just don't think governments will get applauded as universally for it. I don't think that governments will be as insulated from criticism. I think all of that is gone. And and I'll, I want to pick up on something Jenny said because I, like I mentioned, this has hit home for us this last few days because my son is in isolation now or at least can't go to school now. And he had a positive test, not a – or he had a negative test, not a positive test. But what has government been doing for the past four or five months? Lots of things, I presume. But two things that concern me. One – since we knew that vaccines were going to take months, maybe years to be discovered and get distributed, why weren't we spending the last five months working on rapid testing? Why is Health Canada, and I'm not calling for political leadership of Health Canada, but for Pete's sake, the WHO has approved rapid testing for a whole variety of countries that don't have their own regulatory infrastructures because they're too small or too unsophisticated. Why hasn't Health Canada moved on that? So why don't we have rapid testing? Why, if the efficacy is lower, okay, then I understand that. That doesn't mean there's harm in it. It just means that I got to be more careful. It means I got to take three negative tests in a row. It means that if there's a positive test, I got to double up and take then the other test to make sure that it's actually a positive. But get rapid testing in, in place. And I'm worried that we're going to see a recurrence of what happened in long-term care homes. I, I'm worried that the next shoe to drop is we're going to find out that the things you would have assumed got fixed after the barn fire that was long-term care in the in in the spring hasn't been that well fixed and then we're going to have a second wave in those places i hope to god i'm wrong but that's something i'm worried about so if those things happen then you're going to see that not only is government not insulated from criticism they're going to become heavily criticized and probably rightly so well and the liberals should the liberal government and and, and health canada should be criticized because um, last week, uh, there was a debate on it. Uh, I know I, I, uh, th I uh, suggested that the federal government was dragging their heels in uh, approving rapid tests. I got a lot of uh, feedback negatively on Twitter, uh, some from uh, your former colleagues in, uh, uh, in the prime minister's office. And what happens three days later that Health Canada comes out at yesterday and announces that they bought 7.9 million uh, rapid tests from Abbott Labs, but they're not approved yet. And basically what came out at the press conference was, well, we're not actively seeking out uh, any of the verification or the testing or um, uh, any, any of the, um, uh, anything they would have done to prove this works. The companies just haven't given it to us. So that's, this is where the federal government, we've talked a lot about the province's handling of this. How could someone in the federal government over the last six and a half months not think that, um, uh, that would proactively go out to uh, companies that have rapid tests that are being used in uh, Germany, that are being used in Norway, that are being used in Belgium, that are being used in the U.S., and not proactively contact them and say, give us all your stats. Give, give us what you gave those other countries for them to be able to prove uh, the use of it. It just seems, it, it, se it seems very Mickey Mouse. Are we it sure they haven't, though? Because I, th I, th I, th I thought they said at the pre they said at the press conference yesterday that no lab had actively given them uh, any of their uh, testing results. And if you're a, a company and you're looking at Canada, the market's pretty small. So why are you going to sit and try to like cold call random people at Health Canada to try to give them your data when other co countries are proactively reaching out and begging you to sell them the tests? I guess the thing I don't understand about it, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not informed enough on that specific data point, but I, what... I do know is that Health Canada came forward yesterday, obviously feeling the furnace fire of pressure on this point, and said, well, we will approve rapid testing, but we will only approve it for devices that have uh, uh, an 80% efficacy rate. Well, I don't know, man. So uh, how many meet that standard? And do we need to meet that standard? Again, because again, like I go back to it, if, if the efficacy rate is only 70%, like... I get one rapid test that tells me I'm negative. 
I'm not going to take that to the bank. I'm going to take it three days in a row. But because it's a rapid test, I can take it three days in a row. And then I get three in a row and I'm going to say, okay, chances are that negative is a negative. Uh, and if it's a positive, then I double up with the other tests, like I said already. Like I just don't – I don't understand why we can't move on that because to me, rapid testing is an absolute precondition for allowing things to remain open in a world where COVID cases are going to continue to be higher. You can't open up and not have COVID cases rise. And therefore, you need to know – like you need the rapid testing so you can trace and isolate. Like it's just – and why, why Christ, hasn't this been a priority for four months? I agree. See, that's I, where I'm getting to because I don't believe I agree, I don't believe you. I don't agree with you guys. I don't believe that you can't. I don't. I think if I think that if the more governments try to lock down, the more civil disobedience there's going to be. I don't believe people in Quebec are going to stop having people into their homes. I don't. Oh, Scott, and, David, David, just just to clarify, I believe governments will do it. I'm not saying people will listen. That's where I'm at. I'm right. not. Okay. I, well, I I, I think. I don't. I don't think people because I don't think people think that they're. I don't think people think governments know what they're fucking talking about anymore, and they're losing patient. They're losing patience in that, and part of that is lack of transparency about some of these issues. If there is a good reason for not approving rapid testing, why won't somebody tell us what that is? Because there isn't when you look at all their, the other countries that actually have rapid testing. And even the WHO has now come out and said that they've they've approved different tests. And, and some of these tests are at like 93, 94 percent, 90 percent accuracy. So this is the problem that the, the Trudeau government now has is nobody believes uh, that uh, because last week, Patty had you actually came out and said, well, none of these tests are accurate enough for us to be able to use it. And the, you read a newspaper article because people are are still staying very informed about about. Uh, all matters COVID, and you're reading that these tests are happening essentially in almost every Western country uh, in the world uh, already. Yeah, well, uh, do you think, let's go, let, let's move right to BC, because here's the <laughs> question. I mean, they don't have, they, they don't have uh, the same kind of issue in BC, but it's not a non-issue in BC. And is he going to get out of this uh, is he going to get out, out of this alive? The first poll that came out uh, after the uh, campaign was called looked pretty darn good for him yesterday. I think it was an Ipsos poll that showed him with a 13-point lead uh, or something. Uh, probably wouldn't have captured any reaction to the big policy announcement by the provincial liberals that they were going to... Uh, it was like a 16-point uh, lead, I think. I think it was, he, was at 50, he was at 51% and uh, more than that, and the BC Libs are at 33 Okay, eighteen. Well, okay. So it's a, it's a beating. It's a beating at this stage, but it feels to me like the worm is turning on COVID coverage and COVID politics, and he's got three weeks of that yet to, uh, to navigate. I, actually, I think he's actually. I, th I think he's actually fine. He 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 suffered through three to four days of process stories about calling a campaign during a pandemic. That seems to have have gone away. You've got the latest poll, and it had no impact, by the way. No, just. To revisit an issue we've talked about on this pod, there's no apparent impact in the polls from that discussion about the early well, election. No, it, in fact, he's gone up. So he's, he, let's say he's at 51% of the vote um, now. That's 11% more than what he got uh, in the last election. And if you look at the poll, um, he's even leading by 5% in like the interior and, and the north, which I am i don't know the province of BC that much, but I, as, as much as I know places like Ontario, for example, but I think if I was a BC liberal, I would be very nervous that that's actually where... Um, uh, that's actually where the polling stands, if it's if it's accurate. Uh, this, of course, was before Wilkinson did. Uh, I think uh, put out probably the most substantive policy uh, measure uh, two days ago or three days ago uh, in terms of removing the PST uh, for uh, a year uh, during the pandemic uh, recovery and then uh, increasing it to uh, to three percent. I think it's it's tangible. I think people understand what that is, and it's not just going in and you know buying you know a book or or clothes or what have you. There's a lot of hidden costs. In terms of if you're building a house or what have you, that 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 you know could save uh, BC families a lot of money. So these polls that we're seeing now, this I think was probably pre um, Wilkinson doing that poll. So we'll see if if a bold kind of provocative um, uh, policy like that will 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 help them at all. What the fuck is the point of that policy, though? I mean, I can see how it might be, and I or might not be, retail politically attractive to reduce people's. And uh, 
you know, I think that we there, there are people that have campaigned successfully on reducing sales taxes uh, before. <laughs> From uh, seven to six to five. <laughs> fucking blue stickers. I still, I still have some of those. I'll, I'll, next time I see you guys, I'll give you one. That'd be nice because I, I have to go pee about three times a day. But what exact problem? What exact problem is this policy trying to solve? I mean, I would assume that if a person in British Columbia is un, is reluctant to spend right now. It's either because they've lost their job or they're afraid of losing their job. And in either case, saving them a, uh, a few bucks on a purchase doesn't feel to me like the prime motivator there. Yeah, but there's, there's, there, there are people that saving a few bucks means a lot to them. Like it's, it's easy to say that like, oh, well, uh, the, you know, if you're talking about a family that, that is living off of uh, CERB or that have uh, uh, a lower t uh, to middle class income, uh, looking at the course of, of having no sales tax uh, for uh, for an entire year, I think is a very it's tangible. It's what other what other the NDP haven't offered anything uh, like that uh, substantive. I think it's a very I think it's a very good policy. And and yes, economists may not like it. I remember in two thousand and six. Uh, 2005, when when Jim Flaherty and, and Harper did the announcement, uh, I think it was at the Giant Tiger in Ottawa, announcing the re release of the the lowering of the uh, sales tax. You guys, like you guys, went crazy. Economists went crazy, and you know who who liked it? Voters. Well, it is the worst public sure. policy of the last 30 years. But in any event, I, I'm not convinced it's going to actually help Wilkinson. Um, I really am not. I I uh, I, I think. It, I, I like Jenny. I think it has some appeal, so I don't dismiss its appeal. Um, I think we might exaggerate it, but I wouldn't dismiss it. But I think it can be easily uh, overshadowed um, by the NDP. I think Horgan can come back and say, "Look, uh, the more responsible thing to do, and the more urgent and important thing to do right now is uh, to invest more in." Uh, your public health. So rather than <coughs> just slicing some taxes, what I'm going to do is make sure you get this support, this support, and this support. I think that's where people's heads are at. I think that's more where the desire is if you were going strictly on, on the numbers. I think that is where Horgan will go in terms of policy. And I think that's, I, I think it's in his interest to move quickly into bigger policies, fill that gap, talk about where he's going rather than where he's been, quit asking people um, to thank me for the job I've done and start talking to people about the job I'm going to do. I'm not convinced that um, the worm is turning. I, I think that Horgan has lots of cards and he has a big cushion. I don't think they're taking it for granted. I'll, I'll, I really will be shocked if, um, if he doesn't win a, a, a smashing majority. Yeah, so will I, just to be clear. So will I. I think that's definitely the way things are trending. All I was pointing out is that I think COVID is a wild card at this point. And, uh, and I think that uh, if something were to happen there, he's got less cover than he would have had, uh, than he would have had some months ago. I think it goes back to the conversation I was having with Schreiner is uh, he's probably the last one to get in under the wire before the politics turns negative on so, COVID. So can I, I don't think, I don't think I'd be want to face, I don't know what, I don't know what uh, Ford's going to do, but I don't think I'd want to be facing the electorate this spring. So two weeks ago, we all felt that Trudeau was making a mistake by not using the throne speech as a launching pad for a federal election. Do you right. do you think now that he made the right call on that and that you're you were wrong, David? I think the timing was too late. I guess, I think I think I probably was wrong because I wouldn't um, uh, because I I think if you were in week two right now with what's happening in Ontario and Quebec. It uh, uh, it would be more difficult than what I had anticipated to um, to be justifying why we were uh, why we were in a campaign. But I do think that the fall was the window, um, and I think so. Uh, I think by the time I was advocating it, it was probably too late. You might have had to move a little bit earlier, um, but I do think the window is closing on on COVID being a launch pad to reelection. I think I think uh, he I, should have gone. I, I if I if I had if I was a liberal in the in the PMO or in the party, I would have wanted to go. I think that uh, uh, we've talked about it many times. I'll, I, I'm, I'm like a parrot on this. I think the 
uh, economic ramifications of COVID will be what ends up being the downfall of governments. It won't, f- for, it won't fully be the health aspect of it. Um, I think that uh, we'll see how much uh, the, the um, they've, uh, they've extended the, uh, you know, the Canadian emergency wage subsidy. So we'll see what businesses take, uh, take them up on that and see if that will kind of stem the bleeding in terms of any restructuring that, that uh, companies may do over the next uh, six months. Um, but I think this time next year, uh, it could almost be the worst time for a, a government like Trudeau's to, uh, to go. And I'm happy they didn't go. I just think this would have been the best window for them, um, uh, for them to go. And they may be looking at Horgan, uh, and the polling now, and they'll, they'll look on October 24th on election day. If he wins, uh, if he wins the seats, he does based on the polling that we're talking about today and go, fuck, we really should have gone. All right. There's also an election in Saskatchewan that was called yesterday, um, and uh, uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be terribly exciting. The preliminary polls have the SAS party coming in over 60%, um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the early media anticipation is really not about whether or not the government will change, but whether or not the NDP might pick up a seat here or there or lose a seat here or there. But the election seems to be treated as a foregone conclusion. This is a province that had uh, an NDP government as recently as when you were in the prime minister's office, Jenny. Mm -hmm. In your running of the national conservative campaigns, over the period of time from 2004 to 2015, what did you notice happening to the politics of Saskatchewan over that period of time? Well, I think I think in terms of Saskatchewan, uh, the 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 sense is uh, there became more of an Alberta entrepreneurial spirit uh, as uh, as as you know, uh, natural resource development became uh, more of an economic driver in the province. I think it probably it changed the uh, uh, it changed the mindset of uh, of people, uh, especially probably in the rural areas in Saskatoon. I can't speak uh, I can't speak to Regina, but I think that uh, for the most part, um, you know, this this was a fixed date. So it's not like Mo had a choice. It wasn't like a, a you know Horgan where he 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 rolled the dice. He has he has no choice but to go. Uh, and to your point, I think people are happy with how the economy is going for the most part. I think you've got some people that are worried, um, but I think people don't want change. I think that's the last thing they, they um, uh, I think it's the last thing they want. And so I don't think the NDP has a very compelling uh, narrative. And, and if I'm Scott Moe, I want to run and have the most boring, uh, mundane election campaign where, you know, I get to October 26th and uh, it's, it's it, like there have been no new news. It's just him talking about the record and what he's going to continue to do for, uh, for recovery. You know, I, I was, uh, I was originally a provincial liberal in Saskatchewan before I was a federal liberal. And, uh, I, at that time hated, hated people who federal liberals who are, did what I'm about to do now, (laughs) which is to say that, Progressives in Saskatchewan need to uh, put away their partisan tents and create a new alternative to the SAS party. There is no brand, even in a time of COVID, even in a time of relative economic satisfaction, there is no excuse for a 60-30 split in the polls. That is not a competitive political jurisdiction. Um, And, uh, I mean, if you look right next door in Alberta, Kenny is, you know, in a fight with somebody, uh, in a fight with the NDP. Mo's not in a fight with anybody. And uh, I think that the NDP brand uh, has lost its connection to Saskatchewan, and it can't get elected, especially in rural Saskatchewan anymore. The liberal brand is, of course, horribly, horribly toxic, so that's not an alternative. I think that, frankly, the left has to, the center center left has to blow itself up and reform under a different political formulation just like, frankly, the Conservatives did under the SAS party in order to uh, create the possibility of a non-conservative government in Saskatchewan. Otherwise, I just see that going on in perpetuity. They have such a lock on rural Saskatchewan. That is the trick, is what kind of alternative political formulation can win votes in rural Saskatchewan? The NDP used to do that. They can't do it anymore. So what's the... So it feels like suddenly the SAS party, the conservative party out there, 
small C conservative party being the SAS party, has has become the, the structurally advantaged party of government, right? Um, is that is that because of what Jenny said? Is 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 that because there's been a change uh, with the rise of the resource sector in Saskatchewan? Is it a demographic thing? Is it all? But it all like is it just that the NDP? Um, uh, lost touch and they've had, uh, you know, bad luck in terms of leaders. And, you know, like, I mean, what is the, is what's all the chemistry coming apart be, uh, together? Like, is it, is there the, are the NDP just one good policy platform and one good leader uh, away from being able to reconstitute it? Or I guess you're saying no, like, you know, like how do you penetrate that fortress? Of they've had good, they've had good leaders. I don't have any issue with Miley and, uh, I don't have an issue with Miley and Dwayne Lingenfelder is a friend of mine. I think he's a very impressive guy. Yeah. They've had leaders. It just uh, it just doesn't sell there. It doesn't sell there anymore. I think the federal NDP brand has swarmed the provincial NDP brand. Right. I think the uh, I think the CCF NDP in Saskatchewan was an organic development out of Saskatchewan, and the more identity based ideology of the federal NDP now is a foreign thing to Saskatchewan, and I think that that dominates perceptions of the NDP in Saskatchewan. I think Jenny's 100% right that the changing economics of the province changed attitudes um, changed attitudes uh, a fair bit about things, and, and other people, New Democrats, will talk to me about the decline of the social democratic infrastructure that used to underlie the NDP, especially in rural areas, whether that be co-ops, credit unions, labor unions. Uh, all used to exist in 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 significant form, providing a, an essential organizational uh, base foundation for the NDP, and that and that doesn't exist anymore. So there's been a, there's been a lot of changes, um, and uh, I, I think that uh, I think that that brand, if you look at what the results are going to be at the day after the election. Check the results in rural Saskatchewan, and it's just not going to be any competitive in a way that you could look at that and say any of those seats are winnable next time or the time after that or the time after that. It's a lock under the current uh, configuration. So there well, you go. So anyway, though, NDP, carry on for the next three and a half weeks <laughs> and enjoy your opportunities. Yeah, well, ex ex exactly. And, and uh, you know, if there's... Uh, there are any liberals out there knocking on doors don't hate on me but it's just uh it's just a reality if uh we're gonna have to give up that ghost and uh and we're gonna have to create something like the sas party uh in alternative um hey i'm up here in the wilderness i'm gonna be safe you guys stay safe over the course of the next week and uh when we come back we will have some information as to how this uh debate last night affected the U.S. race, and God, I know that's really what's on everybody's mind um, about politics right now. So, we'll be back with more informed thoughts next week. In the meantime, <laughs> Jenny, Scott, thank you very, very much for doing this. Jill, thank Metal, you. and the Air Quotes team, thanks for putting this on. Listeners, thank you for listening. We'll have a mailbag item on the website if you want to go listen to Woo! Jenny, Scott, and I answer. It's a, a smoking mail hot question. website, I'll tell you. If you're not visiting that <laughs> website, mean you are underusing your internet. Completely. And once you're there, you can listen to us ramble on about a mailbag item, and then you can read super smart stuff by people <laughs> like Kate Besenson and Peter Nicholson and uh, Scott Clark. Um, so anyway, if you liked what you heard, give us a shout out. Uh, the ratings are slowing down on iTunes, and that's how they measure and promote things. So if you can work your way to iTunes and give us a rating and a review, that would be super helpful. Thanks for listening as always. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next week.